The text I'm about to read is a passage I've wanted to preach for many years. In fact, I feel like God's been having me write this sermon for a really long time. Now, I don't want to raise your expectations. That does not mean this sermon's <laughs> going to be good, but it will be earnest, okay? It'll be earnest. And I'm going to read this, but here's what I want you to think about. My sermon this morning is a plea to the church to embrace serious thinking as a way to honor Christ in our world. It's time for the church to embrace serious thinking. We live in a very complicated world. There's a lot of problems out there. And unfortunately, some churches are not representing Jesus very well, which is tragic because what the world most needs right now is a very honest and accurate represent, representation of Christ. Amen. Thank you. And we show that to them in large part through the way we think. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Just let the word of God wash over you while I read it. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. No, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as, that, but as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? Look at this. But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. What a statement. This morning, the title of my sermon is, You Have the Mind of Christ. It's time to start using it. Amen? Okay, good. Have a seat. <laughs> Did you know this? Okay, today, my sermon is about the life of the mind. Paul finishes that amazing, passionate, profound passage about wisdom of this world, wisdom from above, spiritual folly, spiritual truth. He ends it all by saying, Christian, let me tell you something. You have the mind of Christ. That is an astounding statement. Did you know that when you became a Christian, you were united to Christ and something fundamental changed in your capacity to think rightly. Did you know that? We've been in a four-part series on a theme that is often neglected in the church. The theme is union with Christ. And what we've been talking about is you read the New Testament and over and over and over, the, the writers of the New, New, New Testament, Jesus included, says, Here's the most basic way to understand who you are as a Christian. You've been joined with Christ. You are in Christ, and Christ is in you. This is profound. And here's the definition we've been working with for union. Union with Christ involves a new spiritual reality in which the believer is joined to the risen Christ in such a way, look at this, that what is true of Christ becomes true of us. Christ was crucified and buried. The believer is crucified with Christ. Christ is raised to new life, power over sin. The believer is raised to new life as well. And not only that, and this is astounding, the spirit of Christ now indwells you 
And that means you have access to the very mind of Christ. This is a sermon about Christians embracing serious thinking. Why? Because you have the mind of Christ. And I'm gonna plead with you today to walk out of here believing that. When I first came to River West in 2006, which was a really long time ago, um, I was early in my ministry. There was a young, younger pastor from Manhattan who was starting to gain some recognition because he was very thoughtful. He was really a gifted teacher. He was starting to write some books. And one of the things that people started noticing was he writes and he teaches a lot like C.S. Lewis. He's a serious thinker. Maybe you've heard of him. His name is Timothy Keller. Timothy Keller um, has impacted me deeply. And one of the very first books that he wrote is a book called The Reason for God. And when I read the introduction, by the way, this should be mandatory reading. If you've never read this book, please go buy one today. This book is absolutely fabulous. When I finished the introduction, I I stood back, I took a sip of coffee, and I said, I'm gonna devour this book. I'm gonna read the rest of this book in the next hour if I can. First of all, he's started the book with a quote from Darth Vader. He had me right there. Um, but, but, but really what, what I realized was this Christian, this pastor, this scholar has embraced serious thinking as a way to glorify Christ. And what he does in the introduction to this book is he says, first of all, he says to believers, hey, Christians, it's time for us to get a little bit deeper in the way we think about our Christian faith. We have anti-intellectualism in our history as evangelicals. We have to shrug that off. It's time to think deeply. Christianity does not require you to stop using your brain. In fact, you cannot be a Christian without really serious, deep thinking. And then he turns sort of the, he turns sort of the, the arrows to the skeptic. And he says, oh, and by the way, you skeptics, if you think you've rejected Christianity because you're so skeptical and and thoughtful and deep, I'm gonna challenge you. It's very possible that your skepticism is actually rooted in anti-intellectualism as well. And so he challenges the skeptic. You have to think deeply. There are really good reasons for God. My sermon today is a plea to believers and to skeptics to think deeply. And by the way, skeptics, I know who you are because you look really skeptical right now. You're looking at me. (laughs) Your your brows are, you're you're looking very skeptical, okay? And what I'm gonna do, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna show you in this passage, Paul says he takes the idea of the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ, which is an astounding claim. I'm I'm gonna unpack it. And he makes three connections. And I'm going to put them up so you can think about this. He says, the mind of Christ and the critical role of thinking in the Christian life. I'm going to talk about that. Then he says, the mind of Christ and what I'm going to call the continental divide of the cross. Don't worry, I'll explain what I mean by that. The cross is like this massive dividing line in our culture, in our world. And then he says, the mind of Christ, and this is where I'll end, and we'll go to communion the non-negotiable trait of humility. I'm gonna end with a massive plea. I've been doing this a lot over the last six months to radical humility in the body of Christ. Amen? Okay, that's where we're going. Number one, the mind of Christ and the critical role of thinking. The very first thing I have to do is I have to expose a really bad idea, which is that the key to the Christian life doesn't have so much to do with thinking as it has to do with just faith. So if you ask the average Christian, what do you most need to be a Christian? A a person would say, well, you need faith. Here's the problem. We've inherited a definition of faith from people out there who are skeptical of Christianity, and this definition is really bad. I'll give you a couple examples. Here's Richard Dawkins. He says, faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith, according to many unbelievers, is belief in spite of, even perhaps because of, the lack of evidence. That's a terrible definition of faith, okay? 
Mark Twain said it much more quickly. He said, faith is believing what you know ain't so. All right, does that sound like Mark Twain? And then here's one of my favorites, Sam Harris, who I absolutely love, but this quote is super obnoxious. He said, we have names for people who have many beliefs for which there is no rational justification. When their beliefs are extremely common, we call them religious. Otherwise, they're likely to be called mad, psychotic, or delusional. Welcome to the church of mad, psychotic, and delusional. Our new mission statement, we're building a community of psychotic people for the world. No, we're not. Okay, that's, that's, that's obnoxious, and here's the problem. If you open the Bible, and you just read, if you just read honestly, and you let the Bible speak for itself, you would never come away with a definition of faith like that. Never. Because over and over and over, the, new, the writers of the New Testament say, you have to think about this. I'm going to use logic right now. I'm going to build a case right now. I'm going to build argument upon argument upon argument. It's going to be logical and coherent, which is how we try to preach here. Because we believe that in order to live the Christian life, and not only that, in order to even come to understand the claims of the gospel, you have to think really deeply. Today is a plea to the church to embrace serious thinking. And if you're thinking, well, I'm not a very deep, cerebral person, that's not true. Can I tell you something? You have the mind of Christ. And your problem is not that you're not cerebral. Your problem is you haven't believed that. You have been given access to divine wisdom because the spirit of Christ is in you. Amen? It's not an accident that Paul, in the very last phrase of verse 16, we look at it, he says, you have the mind of Christ. Now, you gotta realize, there's so many things that Paul could have said right at the end. He could have done all this stuff about wisdom and all this stuff, and then, he, and then he could have said, but don't worry about it, just believe. It doesn't matter, just believe. Or he could have said, he could have said you, you have the Holy Spirit. Or he could have said, you're really wise. But that's not what Paul said. Paul said, you have the mind of Christ. And when Paul says, we have the mind of Christ, this is what he means. He means... We have the mind of Christ, all right? It's not complicated. His whole argument, if you look closely, his whole argument has been that a person who's joined to Christ, when they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they somehow now have access to the thoughts of God. They gain access to the mind of God himself. Let me show you. This is what we do. If you're new to our church and you're wondering what kind of a church have I joined, you've joined a church that, where we, we don't say anything that isn't from the Bible. So we look at your own Bible at verse 11. Look what Paul says in verse 11. I'm gonna go back and go through all the verses, but he says, who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? This is, this is very simple what Paul's saying. He's basically saying, there's no way for you to access what I'm thinking unless I reveal it to you, you know? My wife sometimes says to me when we're having, when we're having intense fellowship, she'll say, you know what? <laughs> she'll say, you're kind of hard to read sometimes, you know? That's what she'll say. I can't read you right now. And I'm like, that's because I'm not a book, Kathy. I don't, I'm not a Jane Austen novel, all right? I'm just a boy. I don't like, and so here's the point. You could very easily hide what you're really thinking from people in your life. And Paul's argument is, if that's true in our relationship with other people, think how true it is in my relationship with God. There's absolutely no way that a finite human being could have access to the thoughts of God, to the mind of God, unless God graciously reveals those thoughts to us by pouring out his Holy Spirit and giving you the mind of Christ. And that's what, that's, that's what Paul's talking about here. 
He's saying, God has to initiate this. God has to do something. God has to pour out something. In fact, what Paul really says is he says, God has to fix something in the way our brains work. And that's a part of salvation. I'm going to put a sentence on the screen, and I, I, I promise you, I bet you've never thought about this, but this is all over the New Testament, and the sentence is this. The mind of Christ is actually a cure. Now, this is a sermon about thinking deeply, and what I'm about to do, you have to think very deeply. The mind of Christ is a cure to one of the impacts of sin that we almost never talk about, which is, and it's all over the Bible, that sin stunts the ability to think rightly about the world and about God. Now, I realize this is not gonna be a very popular couple of minutes here, especially if you're not a believer yet, but just bear with me. The idea is, Sin actually doesn't just affect my heart or my morality, it actually affects my cognitive faculties. And God has to fix that. He has to cure that. Let me show you where that is. Look very closely at verse 14. Paul says, the natural person, that's a person without the Holy Spirit, That person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their folly to him. What Paul's saying is, until you get the Holy Spirit, the things of God sound really foolish. And so you don't accept them because we don't tend to accept things that seem foolish to us. But then look what he says next. Then he says, it's not just that they don't accept those things. He's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. In other words, unless God graciously pours out his Holy Spirit on me, I would never be able to comprehend the things of God, including something as simple as the message of the gospel. I need a brain cure. A great illustration that I've heard about this is, it's kind of like, um, remember in the good old days when you got your computer and then you had, to, you had to load the antivirus software in your computer? We don't do that anymore. Young people are like, what are you talking about, you old man? But anyway, um, you, you'd get a computer and then you had to load antivirus software and that antivirus software would fix little glitches and anything that had kind of come into your computer that was impacting the ability of your hard drive to work efficiently. The mind of Christ is a lot like that. God pours out his Holy Spirit and suddenly things that used to sound really foolish start making sense. Things that I thought that's absolutely, that's just absolutely barbaric and old, whatever. They, they, I start thinking differently about those things. Here's how D.A. Carson said it. He said, he wrote about this passage, what we must constantly remember is that this human inability to understand things is a culpable inability, which means we're in the wrong. We're actually, we're actually responsible for this. God has made us for himself, but we've run from him. The heart of our lostness is our profound self-focus. He's saying sin is, sin is saying the world is about me and, I'm, and I want to run from a God who says anything other than that. But what DA says is that then begins to affect the way you use your brain, the way you respond to evidence and things that you see. Look what he says. He says next, we do not want to know him if knowing him is on his terms. We're happy to have a God we can more or less manipulate. We don't want a God to whom we have to admit that we're rebels, or that we need help, or that we need grace. And so we run out into the world using our brains to suppress all of this evidence that clearly shows we live in a world where there's a creator God. And God says, I can fix that. And the way that I fix that is by pouring out my Holy Spirit, uniting the believer to Christ, and suddenly things start changing in the way your brain works.
And folks, this morning, oh man, I've been praying all morning. I know this is gonna happen this morning for some people in, in our church. Amen. You just pray, pray about that with me. But that leads me to my second connection. I'm gonna take a little bit of time on this one and then the last one will go quickly. So the second thing we need to talk about is the mind of Christ and the continental divide of the cross. Now, what I'm about to do is very complicated, but this is a sermon about thinking deeply, <laughs> okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna put up a slide that shows you that you can take everything that Paul wrote in these verses, 6 to 16, and arrange them in two columns. The whole passage is one massive contrast. So just look at this for a minute. So he, he contrasts true wisdom from heaven versus a, a wisdom of this age, this world. He contrasts the mature, which is one of Paul's ways of just talking about a believer, believers are the mature, and he contrasts that with the rulers of this age who crucified Christ. He contrasts people who have the Holy Spirit versus people who have the spirit of the world, and he contrasts the spiritual person with the natural person, and the question is, what is the divide, what is the massive contrast between those two lists, and I'm gonna argue, next slide, it's the cross. I'm not an artist, all right? I'm a pastor, so just keep your criticisms to yourself, <laughs> all right? The cross, the cross is the continental divide between those who have the mind of Christ and those who don't, those who have access to wisdom from above and those who are, who are fixated on the wisdom of the world, those who have the spirit and those who don't. And I'm not just talking about the impact of the cross, I'm talking about the way that you think about the cross. The way that you respond to the cross. How do you react when you hear people in the church talk about the cross? Your emotional, uh, uh, intellectual, visceral reaction to the cross tells you where you're at. Have you ever noticed a lot of people are wearing crosses a lot today in our culture? That's a big fashion thing. They're everywhere. You see crosses all over the place. And I don't want to judge people by a cover, but some of the people wearing crosses, I'm like, I'm pretty sure you don't believe what that is, that symbol that you're wearing. The cross is kind of a radical idea. It's pretty, it's a big thing. And how you respond to that, Paul says, that's, that's the key. Let me show you. So basically, go to, look, look at verse six. Paul starts talking about two kinds of wisdom. And what you need to realize is that he's, he's already started this contrast earlier in the letter. And what I'm gonna do is read you a couple of the verses back in chapter one. And you tell me if you can sniff out what Paul's saying about the cross, Okay? Here's verse 17 and 18. Paul said, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross be emptied of its power. So Paul says, I've been sent to preach the gospel, but here's the thing you need to realize. I do everything that I can to avoid sounding overly eloquent, or using human forms of wisdom. And he contrasts that. He says, the reason I don't do that is that I don't want the cross to be emptied of its power. So he's making a contrast between worldly eloquence, sounding important, sounding impressive, even seeming like you're really wise in a worldly way, versus the message of the cross. And then look at the very next verse. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. People hear the message of the cross and they go, that sounds totally foolish. And some people hear the message of the cross and they go, that sounds like the most breathtaking good news that I've ever heard. Amen. So what's the difference? And then now look at verse 22 to 24. This is so profound. <clears throat> 
Paul goes on, he says, Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, and look at this, the wisdom of God. Paul says, the word of the cross is not just the power of God, it's actually the wisdom of God. If you said, Paul, define God's wisdom in two words, Paul would say, no problem. Christ crucified. That is the wisdom of God. It's, it's, it's a core value. It's a philosophy. It's a way of thinking about the world. And for God, it's incredibly wise. But for, but for humans who don't have the Holy Spirit, they hear that and they go, that sounds really foolish to me. Why? I think I know why. Think about this with me for just a minute. The cross stands for the total helplessness of humankind and the radical kindness and grace of God. That's what it, it's, the, the cross is radical. Do you know what it means? It means human beings were totally helpless in our sin. And God was radically wise and kind. Human wisdom is offended by this because it requires us to be completely humbled and to admit there's absolutely nothing I can do to save myself. Human wisdom thinks this is foolish because it makes God look all powerful and benevolent and kind and it makes human beings look dependent and helpless. And if there's one thing that humans who think they're wise never want to do, they never want to admit that they're helpless and dependent on the grace of God. And God says, that's my wisdom. You're never going to find me through the wisdom of the world. You're only going to find me through the wisdom of the cross. Folks, have you been running around in this world trying to fix all of your own problems, trying to solve all the things that are going wrong in your life, trying to pick yourself up and, and fix yourself morally, trying to make your life all fit together, and you're running yourself ragged. And the message of the gospel says, the wisdom of God is that God sent his one and only son to hang on a cross, to take away all of the sin and the brokenness of your life and give you a new heart and a new spirit. And you, all you have to do is humble yourself and say, God, I receive that in faith. Amen. And that's the wisdom of God. That's the wisdom of God. Now, let me get really practical. And then I promise you I'm almost done because some of you are getting really skeptical. You're like frowning at me. Here's something really practical, okay? The cross then, what Paul's saying is he's saying the cross is your litmus test for whether or not an idea or a teaching or a philosophy or a worldview is from heaven? Is it wise from heaven or is it something else? Paul says, do you want to think seriously as a, with the mind of Christ? The cross is the litmus. Okay? What do I mean by that? What I mean is, you're, you're listening to a, a, a person who's online. You're listening to an influencer. You're reading a book that someone's just written. Maybe that book person even claims that they speak for God. And as you're reading the book, you begin to realize they're making lots of claims about religion, spirit, spirituality, faith. They're making claims about politics. They're making all kinds of claims. But I've noticed something they never talk about Christ crucified. They don't go there. It's, it's always about, maybe it's about humans are amazing. You can do, I've read a lot of books about spiritual practices, okay? Some of them are good, some of them not as good. And some of them are, 
all about, here's what you can do to be spiritual. You're amazing. There's not anything necessarily inherently wrong with you. And you start reading the book and you realize that author claims to be speaking for God, but they never talk about the cross. That book is not wise. That book is missing the heart of the gospel. Look at verse eight for just a second. Paul talks about the rulers of this age, okay? And what I, what I want you to notice about that is when Paul talks about the rulers of this age, a modern equivalent would be thought leaders, influencers, people who have a blue check by their, by their, you know, by their name on social media. These are people who are putting out ideas. These are people who are thought leaders. These are the intelligentsia of society. And Paul would say... If they don't treasure the cross, because the rulers of this age clearly didn't because they crucified the Lord of glory. Paul says, that's one of the ways you figure out. I'm sort of sniffing out. This is a little weird. Last Sunday, I talked with a guy who, who was visiting our church for the very first time, really new to Christian faith. He walked in, he sat through the whole service. He walked over and he was like, he was like, that was, that was so different. I've been to all these churches. He goes, last week, I was, and I'm not here to slam on other churches, except for just this one quick moment. I'm gonna slam on one church. Uh, just one moment, okay? We're a grace-based organization. Forgive me later. He was like, I went to a church, and the pastor for 30 minutes talked about himself, and then at the end of the sermon, Jesus got a cameo. And you know what, I promise you, even in that sermon, the cameo that Jesus got was not Christ crucified. If you sit through a sermon or you listen to a podcast or you read a book by someone who claims they've got wisdom about American politics and they don't glorify the Christ who was crucified for sin, send the book back to Amazon, amen? It's not the wisdom of God. Okay? Am I being really intense right now? I apologize. I'm passionate about this. You want to know why I'm passionate? Because I, I know what's happening in our culture. We have access to so many things. Just because someone claims they're speaking for God does not mean they're speaking for God. There's two kinds of wisdom. There's wisdom from heaven and there's wisdom from this world. And Paul says the dividing line is the cross of Christ. That's where the wisdom is. Friends, this is a plea for the church to embrace serious thinking because our culture needs to start seeing examples of Christians who actually look like Christ. Amen. Amen. And that leads me to my final point. The mind of Christ and the non-negotiable trait of humility. There is no such thing as an arrogant mind of Christ. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as a condescending mind of Christ. There's no such thing as a combative mind of Christ out there in the world. Someone who's really combative and opinionated and condescending and they're constantly tearing people to shreds and then they say, oh, and I also, I also follow Jesus. Really? Are you sure about that? Because Jesus was not combative. Jesus was not condescending. Jesus did not tear into people. Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem where he hung on a cross to pay for the sins of the world. Trait number one, that I have the mind of Christ, is radical humility. And I'm going to show you where it is. Look at verse 12, and I'll end here. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who's from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Do you notice the very first phrase of that? We have received. Friends, you and I did not do anything to get the mind of Christ. It was a gift from a gracious God. 
who poured out his Holy Spirit. And how I pray that happens this morning for some of you. Will you bow your heads with me? I'm gonna have the worship team come. I'm gonna pray. Heavenly Father, it is so good to be confronted by ideas in your word, even ideas that challenge what we thought before we came in. There's something refreshing about that. We need to be challenged. The purpose of your scriptures is not to tell us that everything we think is already correct. The purpose of your scriptures is to help us see things through a different lens, through the lens of your wisdom, God. Through the lens of your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, may we be today, in all humility, may we be a church who begins to think seriously with discernment. May we be people who treasure the cross. Like the old hymn writers who would say things like, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gains I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. I pray we would love the cross, treasure the cross, recognize the cross as our salvation, and then live in the way of the cross. And for your glory, Jesus, we pray. Everyone said, amen. I'm gonna invite you to the table this morning um, to get the bread and the cup. And then when you get those, return to your seats and hold on to those for just a minute. I'll come back and I'll, I'll lead us in the eating and the drinking, but come to the table. While you're holding that bread and that cup, I'm just gonna read to you a couple of verses from Philippians chapter two. There's a lot of words in here that come from what we just read in 1 Corinthians. Just listen to this. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy, look at this, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Paul goes on to talk about the humility of the cross. And so this moment is really, it's, it's many things, but it's, it's a moment where we embrace a lifestyle of total humility like our leader. And every time we gather, the meal is meant to give us courage and strength to walk out the door and live radical lives of humility where we think deeply about Christian things. And so we take that bread, the body of Christ, and let's eat together. in that cup, the blood of Christ, the blood of the new covenant that takes away your sins. Let's drink. Amen.